It's a great pleasure to have Professor Shota Komatsu from Theory Department of CERN. Um, his exp expertise area is quantum gravity string theories and uh, not only uh, particularly quantum gravity string theories, he actually worked on several things, CFTs, ADAs, a lot of things. Uh, he did his PhD from Tokyo University on 2014. Then he was a postdoc for three years at Perimeter Institute for Theoretical Physics. And then he shifted to IAS Princeton and he stayed for three years and recently he shifted to CERN to join this new position. So uh, thank you very much Shota for accepting this uh, um, invitation for giving this lecture and uh, we are very grateful that you have uh, like giving this uh, um, talk and uh, this is the 47th uh, series lecture of this quantum aspects of space time matter and uh, yeah like this you can say that this is the kind of celebration week we are almost reaching towards 50 and uh, yeah so uh, he is going to talk about uh, a particular topic which is very interesting uh, wheels and loops, matrix port product states, and integrability. So it is based on his works. So please, Shota, you can start. And uh, yeah, thanks again. All right. Uh, thank you for the introduction, very kind introduction. Uh, and thank you, Sayantan, also for like putting together this wonderful uh, seminar series, uh, in particular in this like a difficult uh, COVID situation where people cannot meet directly and in person. I think it's really a great initiative to start this seminar series. And also, like I think uh, all, uh, I understand all the talks are recorded and uploaded, and those will be very variable resources in this research community uh, even after like all these things are over so with that uh, let me start my talk so i'm going to uh, talk about uh, something that's based on uh, my works that are going to appear hopefully very soon uh, with Yungfen Zhan who is a postdoc at CERN and Amit Seber who used to be at CERN and right now in uh, Tel Aviv University and Edward Vescovi, who is a postdoc in Uppsala. Uh, well, sorry, in Noridita. And what I'm going to talk about uh, is some like new ways of studying Wilson loops, which is basically motivated by the analysis of supersymmetric uh, Jan Mill theory. But uh, we hope that the general formulas might be useful also for like other cases, including non supersymmetric theories. Okay, so this is the plan of my talk. And so my talk will consist of two parts. The first part is how to rewrite, is about how to rewrite the Wilson loop into a matrix product states. And I'm going to explain how to do it uh, in a simple example in non supersymmetric YAML theory. Uh, but the caveat is that I'm going to explain only uh, how to do it at tree level. Uh, the loop corrections can be included like perturbatively, but right now I don't know how to do it at the non perturbative level. And however, uh, we know for the supersymmetric Wilson loop in N equals four super mills, one can kind of extend uh, this idea uh, by combining other techniques, which, in, which is in particular integrable. And it shows how this uh, idea or formalism that I'm going to present in the first part is connected to these non perturbative methods uh, with which we can study uh, Susie Wilson loop at finite coupling. So, so let's start. So, the first part is just about Wilson loop and the relation to the matrix product state. And let me just first remind you what is the what is Wilson loop and why it's important. So the Wilson loop in gauge series are given by this kind of expression. So, so because it's gauge theory, you have a mu, which is a gauge field, and you consider the pass ordered exponential of that gauge field and take a trace under some representation. So 
as this expression shows, the Wilson loop depends on two, uh, like has two labels. One is the shape of the contour, which I denoted by C, and the other is the representation R, which is basically representation of the of the SUN group if you consider SUN Young Mill theory. And so the the reason why people are interested in Wilson loops are because firstly the Wilson loop Wilson loops are basic gauge invariant observables. So by considering like a various shapes of the Wilson loop and expand in powers of the shape in the deformation, for instance, you can like construct various local operators. So basically like a, a Wilson loop almost know everything about gauge invariant operator. And another important point is that uh, Wilson loops are actually order parameter from co for confinement. So if you compute the Wilson loop, and then like uh, if you are in the confinement phase, the Wilson loop is known to behave the area law, which is which is base, basically saying that uh, expectation of the va expectation value of the Wilson loop behaves like a e two minus area, where area is the area inside so, uh, this. Sh sh Shota, I have a question. Yes. So, uh, when this confinement, you are considering what uh, these states uh, for this uh, expectation. What what are the like? Okay. Yeah. Right. Right. So in the case of well, so this expectation value uh, can be the vacuum expectation value okay. or the like a finite temperature expectation value. And okay. I guess like a finite temperature is more interesting because if you consider pure and mill theory and consider finite temperature, mm -hmm. then in the lower energy, so at low temperature you are in the confinement phase, but at high temperature you are in the deconfinement phase, mm -hmm. where the expectation value behaves like exponential minus parameter. Mm -hmm. So any kind of phase transition you can observe here? Uh, well, this, I would say like a Wilson loop is just an order parameter for confinement. Uh, okay. And uh, if there is other kind, there are other kinds of phase transition, um, it's not guaranteed that uh, you can uh, see it in the Wilson loop. Ah, okay. But, and in the modern language, uh, I'm not going to explain the details of it. Like in the modern language, uh, this uh, difference between the confinement and confinement can be uh, understood as the uh, the symmetry breaking associated with one form symmetry, which is a kind of more exotic symmetry than the usual symmetry. Okay. But if you don't understand it, or if you are not familiar with it, then you can just neglect it. Okay, so. Another important point, especially which is mu much more relevant uh, for my talk, is that in the large n, if you consider like SUN gauge theory and I take a large n limit, and especially if you consider uh, the fundamental representation, so take R to be fundamental of SUN, then we know that this Wilson loop typically has like holographic description. So uh, you can compute the expectation value by considering string worksheet. Uh, stretching in like ADS direction. So you have some, you have a gate theory living on this like a D-dimensional uh, sub-manifold and then you have some holographic theory which include quantum gravity which is D plus one dimension. And then uh, the way to compute this uh, Wilson loop in this holographic description is to compute like consider string worship which is two-dimensional and which is attached to the Wilson loop uh, at the boundary. So this was first discussed by Mauda Sena. And so, but let me just uh, expand a little bit more about this large N Wilson loop. And so, here was talk about holography, it tells us, but this kind of surface also shows up uh, if you, if, even if you don't consider holography. So the idea is to use the Tofuft expansion. So, uh, as you probably know that in the, if you take a large n limit while keeping g m mu square times n to be finite, then all the Feynman diagrams can be classified uh, into like a, into into like a different two D surfaces, so which is often called a Tufte expansion. And so let's see how we, how Tufte expansion goes if you consider Wilson loop in the fundamental representation. So here you have some Wilson loop in the fundamental representation, and in the large n limit, uh, 
you basically uh, consider like a various gluon exchange uh, in between these Wilson lines. And in particular, in the large element, it is used for to use the double line notation uh, for the Wilson, for the uh, diagram, uh, which was first discussed by Tufuft. And so the typical diagram in the double line notation is given by this. So these are like a glue on three glue on vertices, and these are glue. This is glue on exchange. And as I said, uh, in the large N limit, uh, the diagrams are classified uh, in terms of topology of the two two D surfaces. And in particular, if you take a strict large N limit, uh, the leading diagram, the dominant contribution basically comes from diagram which are called planar. And in this case, planar diagram uh, basically corresponds to any diagram that you can draw uh, on a 2D surface with disk topology. So here you have a Wilson loop, and then here you have some, you imagine having some fictitious surface, and then you can draw a diagram on top of it. So any diagram that you can draw on this 2D surface is called a planar diagram. Uh, of course, like uh, there are also non-planar diagrams. For example, if you take this uh, gluon exchange diagram and instead connecting this point and this point, but you connect this point and this point, then you have some crossing of this double line. Then you can no longer, no longer uh, draw this diagram on a simple 2D plane, which is like, like a flat. And in that case, uh, those, di uh, those diagrams are called long planar diagrams. And it is known that in the large N limit, the di contribution from those diagrams are suppressed by powers of one over N. And so this was just like a diagrammatic and uh, like a Feynman diagrammatic uh, consideration. But then you could ask whether there is any physical interpretation of this 2D surface. And I should emphasize that as again, like this is so far, this was just like a 2D surface was something like a bookkeeping device, and there was no guarantee that there is any physics uh, associated to it. However, uh, as I alluded to in the previous slide, uh, there is actually physical interpretation, and ADS CFT, or more precisely, holography, provides one interpretation. And so what, so let me just write down explicitly what the holographic map is. So the map is as follows. If you want to compute the expectation value of the Wilson loop in the large N limit, so this is, again, like, let, let me emphasize that this is computed by pass integral of D plus one dimensional gauge theory. So it's a higher dimensional gauge theory. Then it is given by uh, the pass integral of one plus one D system and where you have some like uh, action and and then you have some a boundary condition uh, which basically says that uh, this uh, 2d uh, 1 plus 1d system has a kind of disk topology and the boundary condition is determined in such a way that uh, the boundary of this 2d surface is anchored on the position of the person loop okay and in picture uh, this is what i just said so this is just a, a, a more formal way of expressing what I wrote here. And from the 2D point, so this is a, more like a space-time picture, but from the 2D point of view, again, as I said, it's just like a, some a pass integral with a disk topology and the boundary condition set by a shape of the Wilson loop. And so this is basically saying that this Wilson loop expectation value in the large N limit is given by a disk partition function of one plus one dimensional system. Okay, and, and more, uh, so this basically is motivated by the string theory. And this is just like a theory living on the string worksheet. And we know that the string worksheet has a conformal invariance. And using conformal invariance, I can uh, map this picture into this picture. Basically, I'm kind of doing the radio quantization. Then you have some state living at the boundary here. And then vacuum state, which basically corresponds to insertion of nothing. So from this picture, you can also say that this disk partition function is nothing but the overlap between some state which describes the boundary, which is, by the way, often called the boundary state, and the ground state, where the ground state corresponds 
will basically mean that there is no, no like a, nothing singular happening in the middle. So these give you like a three different like holographic way of understanding the Wilson loop. Now, with this picture in mind, you can also consider a small generalization uh, of the Wilson loop. So instead of considering just the expectation value of the Wilson loop, uh, you can also consider uh, the correlation function between the Wilson loop and some local operator, which is called a single, which is often called a single trace local operator. So unlike the Wilson loop, which is defined on a, like a one dimensional contour, local operator is defined at a point in space time. And uh, typically, and the single trace operator means that you multiply this f mu nu or some fields in gamma mil theory and then take a trace. So this is a kind of one simple way of constructing a gauge invariant operator. Now, so let's suppose you want to con consider this object. Uh, then a uh, holographic picture is as follows. So previously, I only had this shape of the string worksheet, but now I have Wilson loop and also local operator inserted at the boundary of ADS. So the string worksheet needs to know both. So, and, the, and like a, the natural worksheet that you can draw is something like this. And again, if you understand this picture, if you try to understand this picture from the 2D theory, living on this like a 2D surface, then it's basically like you have some boundary. So I, again, like a, as in the previous case, but now you have something here, which corresponds to this something, this cusp. And from the 2D theory point of view, this must be some kind of operator insertion. So now, instead of just having like a disk partition function, we have a disk with some insertion of vertex operator, with operator, which I called vertex operator. And by performing the same conformal transformation, you can also view this uh, as this. So now you have a boundary state again, as in the previous case, but you have some non-trivial state here, uh, V, which is basically some vertex operate corresponding to this operator. Okay, so of course, like so far, what I've been saying is just like a, just a picture and what we, you, what we expect to get and what is the kind of intuition coming from holography. But the overall lesson is that uh, if you believe in holography, uh, this W and a W O uh, must be uh, given by the overlap in this, some kind of overlap in this uh, like auxiliary one plus one dimensional system, okay? So this was again, like, let me just show again the lesson. However, so this is the lesson I, uh, like uh, we've got from holography, but I should emphasize that this equality is, is su suggested by holography. However, but it's very non-trivial st statement if you just know about the gauge theory. Like if you just consider the gauge theory, then it's a, like a weird statement. Like uh, I don't know how to see this one plus one dimensional theory or I don't know how to recast this object as an overlap. And basically the punchline of the talk is to present some systematic construction of a map between like a Wilson loop to this state and explain how to recast the, this computation of the Wilson loop and the Wilson loop and the local operator as an overlap in one plus one dimensional theory. And furthermore, the second interesting point is that this state B, which corresponds to the B product from one plus one dimensional system. And Furthermore, uh, in n equals four sup m mills in 4D, exact computation is possible thanks to integrability. So these were basically punchline of the talk. So if you don't get the more technical part of my talk, but these are basically take home messages. Okay, is there any questions so far? If you have any question, please ask. Otherwise, you can proceed and people will ask later, maybe. Okay. Is there any? Okay, so maybe I can proceed. 
So, so le let's start with this, these two parts. And to do that, uh, there are two key ideas. Uh, the first key idea is to consider a generating function of Wilson loop. So in the previous discussions, I was mainly talking about the Wilson loop in the fundamental representation, but it turns out it's much better to consider this object. So instead of considering like a trace of pass ordered exponential, I'm going to consider determinant of identity matrix plus E to IA times the pass ordered exponential. And this object, when you expand in powers of E to IA, the first term gives you one. Well, that's because you are just like computing determinant of the identity operator. And the second term, uh, it's not so hard to convince yourself that the second term gives you trace in the fundamental representation of this WC times E to IA. And the next term is, uh, now this is a little bit more complicated, but if you carefully do the analysis, then you see that you have e to 2 ia, but that's of course coming from the fact that you are uh, at the second order in perturbation. And, and now instead of having like a trace in the fundamental representation, you have a trace in the antisymmetric, rank to antisymmetric representation. I'm going to explain, uh, give you in a minute, like a different way of understanding why you are getting this antisymmetric representation. So here is some parameter. Yeah, A is just some like a bookkeeping device. Yeah, okay. some chemical potential that I introduced. Okay. But indeed, like uh, that was a good question. And thanks to the parameter A, I can always start from this and just extract this one, for instance, like uh, the fundamental Wilson, Wilson loop in the fundamental representation, which is the most basic one. How do I do that? I just need to do the Fourier transformation. Yes. Because I see that you, you have e, e to i A. And the second key point is to rewrite the, this generating function, function in terms of 1D fermion, uh, which I'm going to explain shortly. So in what follows, I will show how to rewrite, perform this rewriting at true level of the mill theory in four steps. And one can include a, a loop corrections perturbatively but that's going to make the story more complicated. So I'm going to show you how to do it at tree level. So step one. So step one is to express Wilson loop as 1D fermion. So let me just first write down the uh, claim and then explain uh, why it is true. So the claim is as follows. Take this determinant of one plus E to I A W C and it can be expressed as a pass integral of one dimensional fermion, or I should say zero plus one dimensional fermion, leaping on the contour of the Wilson loop. And the action of this fermion is given by uh, this expression. So this is chi dagger delta minus ia minus ia mu x dot mu x tau d tau. So if you look at this part, this looks really like Wilson loop. Uh, and in particular because it's exponentiated. But uh, here I don't have explicit pass ordering or I don't have any, in, in, in addition, I have some other pieces, which is like chi dagger uh, delta chi. And I should also say that this chi is the fundamental representation of SUN, whereas this chi dagger is anti-fundamental representation of SUN. So by contracting chi and chi dagger, chi dagger you can construct like SUN invariants and you can also construct a CN invariance by taking chi and multiplying a mu and multiplying it chi dagger. So as I said, chi and representation, oh, by the way, I'm going to denote this generating function z of wave from now on. So this relation was actually rediscovered many times in the history. And I think the first paper appeared around 1980 and it was also discovered, kind of rediscovered in the context of supersymmetric gaze theory by Gomis and Pastrini. Well, they actually did a little bit more because they made some connection to the D-brains. Uh, but one, uh, among all those papers, uh, which kind of rediscovered this expression, one paper that I liked is this paper by B. Broda around 1990. 
uh, about which I'm going to say a little bit more later. So this is the title of that paper. Okay, so let's now explain, uh, rough, uh, give a rough explanation how this works. And to see how it works, uh, so, so you first, it's better to start from the right hand side, so which is given by the path integral expression and pass to the Hamiltonian expression of this uh, fermion. So this is just a standard like way of like going from path integral to the Hamiltonian description. But in the Hamiltonian description, uh, this path integral is given by some trace over the fermion Hilbert space, chi Hilbert space. And what's inside a trace is e2 minus h times e2 i a n chi. This expression you can basically just derive so you have because you have some Lagrangian and then you can just try to derive the uh, Hamiltonian from it. And as a result, you get this combination. And in this uh, Hamiltonian picture, what we are doing is basically canonical quantization. And, and the canonical quantization gives you this uh, anti-commutator. And n chi is precisely just number operator because they are canonical conjugate, whereas h uh, is given by this expression. Well, this basically follows from uh, this Lagrangian and pass into the Hamiltonian. So this, so here I wrote explicitly like uh, decomposed AMU into generator of SUN. So you have like AMU where A is the uh, label for generator of SUN. So there are like N, N squared minus one A's. And here I have like a chi dagger TA chi A. So, okay, so now uh, let's try to understand. Yeah. Can, mm -hmm. uh, I think we can do, but I'm just asking. So can we do for Majorana case also, Majorana fermion? Uh, yeah, so in that case, I guess you will get something like a Papian, and uh -huh. which is probably more appropriate for SON uh, gauge theory. Ah, okay. Rather than SUN. Okay. So instead of like a determinant, you get pa uh, Papian. And that's kind of more natural thing to do if you want to consider SOM gauge theory. So if you want to consider generating function of Wilson loop in SOM gauge theory. Okay. So now let's, uh, to understand this relation that I'm going to prove, uh, let's consider uh, this, take this object. So like, so here now the summation over A is implicit and then act this operator on the M fermion state. So you start from the vacuum and then multiply M creation operator of fermion. So this is the vacuum in this fermion Hilbert space. And of course, because uh, fermions obey like anti-commutation relations, uh, these AI must be all different. And now what I'm gonna do is to take this and then use this anti-commutation relation and see what I'm going to get. And first of all, uh, if I have just one chi dagger, then it's very easy to see what I'm going to get. So I have like a chi dagger and because of the anti-commutation, uh, you kill this chi dagger with chi and then you are left with chi dagger. And that basically uh, gives some uh, transformation, and the action of that, if you translate it in terms of like a, uh, indices, then it's precisely the how the uh, fundamental representation transforms. On the other hand, like if you have multiple chi daggers, then uh, uh, can give delta function after doing the anti-commutator. And if you carefully analyze it, then you discover that action of this guy on this state is the same as action of uh, M anti-symmetric representation uh, of the, sorry, action of the generator uh, of M anti-symmetric representation on this set of indices. Okay, so this is just like a, a simple exercise. One can work, try to work it out. And, and this basically says that uh, if you take this ob object and act on the M Hilbert's, M premium Hilbert space, 
then it's isomorphic to the action of the rank M antisymmetric representation, sorry, the action of the generator of SUN on rank M antisymmetric representation. And more explicitly, uh, this basically means that this trace over the human Hilbert space can be split into a sum over M, where M is the particle number. And for each M, I have a trace over uh, M uh, over rank M, antisymmetric representation. And here inside you have pass ordered, the pass ordered exponential, which is Wilson loop, which comes from taking a trace of this. And furthermore, uh, uh, because just because like I restricted myself to M particle sector, this N chi just gives you M. So this basically uh, gives you a proof that this pass integral is the same as this determinant, which is basically a generating function of all these like antisymmetric representation. Okay. Is there any questions so far? Okay, so let me just proceed. So, so some extra, let me make some extra comments. Uh, for SU2, so, so so far I've been talking about SUN, but you can, some of you might have noticed that for, uh, this has something, this, this is a little bit similar to what people call Schwinger boson representation for the SU2. And in fact, uh, for the case of N equals two, there is some similarity. So also in the Schwinger boson, like uh, you typically express like a uh, generate, sorry, generator of, group, of the group using some bilinear bosons. And this idea, uh, is actually like a sometimes applied in a different context like lattice gauge theory and knows and goes under the name of this one and and with some uh, application in mind in this quantum computing but um, I'm not going to explain in detail and I just like encourage people to look at this literature if you are interested but I should also say that uh, that these literature only discussed for SU2 or SU3 Okay, and and there is yet another comment. Uh, so earlier I mentioned the paper by Broda, uh, which kind of which is one paper which rediscovered this formal formalism, but Broda actually went a little bit further. So here I explain how to rewrite this Wilson loop operator into a pass integral of one-dimensional fermion. And, but he actually pointed out that you can even write it as a pass integral of two dimensional fermion. So this is a kind of interesting system. So the original Yamu theory is of course living in four dimensional space time, but now you have some uh, system which is like uh, entirely localized in this two dimensional plane. And that is going to give you the Wilson loop. So the idea is very simple. So the action they write for the two dimensional uh, he wrote for the two-dimensional fermion is given by this expression. Here, sigma is basically any 2D surface uh, uh, whose boundary is given by the Wilson loop C. And he writes this expression. So this chi is now living on this like a two-dimensional surface parameterized by sigma and tau. And although it's it might not be obvious at first sight, uh, it turns out that this action is basically total derivative and gets contribution only from the boundary. And because of this, this actually reduces to the action for the 1D fermion. And that is why uh, this uh, 2D fermion action is the same as 1D fermion. Of course, like uh, from the gate theory side, uh, if you don't have know anything about large N or string theory, uh, this is just kind of trivial rewriting and you might wonder what this is good for. But we do know that like uh, the Wilson loop should be like holographically dual or or we know that like uh, thanks to the Tukufit expansion, Wilson loop, there should be some 2D surface associated with the Wilson loop. And the fact that you can immediately get the 2D 
uh, object uh, from this rewriting is a little bit interesting, but I should say like uh, not much work has been done since this paper and there might be like a, a possibility of connecting this idea uh, to some more realistic holography. But of course it might be hard, but I feel it's worth exploring. So this was some extra comment that I wanted to make. Okay. So now I finished step one. So let me just remind you that what I did in the step one was to rewrite the Wilson loop as a pass integral of 1D fermion. And the next step uh, is to basically integrate out uh, Yam mills. So we now have the coupled system between Yam mills and 1D fermion. And in the next step, I'm going to integrate out Yam mills. And of course, this step is hard uh, to do it, do that finite coupling. And we can only do it in, in perturbation theory. And in particular, I'm going to show how to do it at tree level today. So let me just remind you that what I wanted to add, understand was the correlation function between the generating function and possibly some insertion of single trace operator. And this is given by the coupled pass integral, uh, the 4D field and 1D field, and you have two actions and you have insertion. And this combined action uh, can be brought to uh, the following form. So you have the usual yam mills action, and now you have a coupling term between uh, 4D system and 1D system. And then you have a, a, a kinetic term for uh, 1D fermion. And this J mu basically dictates the coupling between 4D and 1D, and its precise form is given by this expression. So you have a delta function localized at the contour of the whistle loop, x tau, and the source is given by this expression. So original action contain like x dot, a mu x dot, chi dagger chi, and I just rewrote it in a different way. So this makes it clear that Wilson loop is a source term of the gauge field, which we kind of knew it already. So now, uh, starting from this action, I'm going to, so this is the action that I started with, and I'm going to integrate out a mu at tree level. And so at tree level, this is just a Gaussian action and you are just having like a linear source. In, so integrating out is trivial and it basically generates Gaussian term, but non local uh, of J mu, where J mu is this coupling term. So more precisely, I get this kind of action where uh, this, uh, like a, where this J mu X and J mu Y is connected by the propagator of the gauge field. Okay, so this is basically like a just uh, Gaussian integration. So you can derive it in a different way, like a completing the square or just doing the perturbations here and realize that you can uh, resum it and exponentiate the final result. Okay, so this is one effect of integrating out the mu. But there is also another effect. So basically, uh, having linear source and integrating out Gaussian field is the same as like a, a solving the equation of motion for a mu in the presence of the source j mu. So what do we get if you do so? So if you do so, in particular, if you have some extra operator insertion, then what you get is that you have originally you had operator, but now you replace it with uh, this solution to the equation of motion with a source term. So again, solving the equation of motion is also trivial because you have, what you just need to do is to like uh, take term and then apply prop and integrate over the position of the source. So that's the most typical way of solving the uh, linear equation of motion. And so basically what I'm saying here is that uh, this, Wilson loop gives you some background value of a mu and you just need to evaluate this operator or in the presence of that background value. Okay. So, so as a result, uh, written more explicitly, I basically end up with two terms. One is this term, 
well, the, the two, two important effects. In one is this term. Remember that J mu was the bilinear of fermion. So this J mu J nu term is actually uh, quartic in fermion. So you have like a new quartic interaction term of fermion. So here I re write, I wrote everything explicitly. And this part comes from the propagation uh, propagator of the gauge field. And in the replacement, I can also write it explicitly and it's given by this expression. Okay. So basically this rep re replacement rule replaces a mu with the bilinear of fermion. And in addition, I have some extra quoting interaction of fermions. So now uh, I have the action, which is like a bi Gaussian in fermion and also like a quartic in, quartic in fermion. And now it's kind of simple what to do. We just, uh, so it's a kind of well-known trick in solving ON models, for example, for example. The idea is to use the hubbard stratonovich transformation, uh, which is to integrate in uh, this auxiliary field rho, which basically corresponds to chi dagger chi. So after integrating in, I get this action. So if you start from this action and then integrate out rho, you can immediately convince yourself that you get back to this action, where this G is this propagator piece, okay? So this is the action that you get. And here I already like a rewrote everything in terms of to fifth coupling, which is G M mu squared times N, uh, which is more convenient for analyzing the large N limit. Okay, so so now I have the action. So now I'm left with this action, uh, which is bilinear in rho and also bilinear, sorry, yeah, bilinear in chi. And because it's bilinear in chi, I can just integrate it out. And because it's fermion, that gives you determinant. But importantly, because chi is in the fundamental representation of SUN and chi dagger is in, in the anti-fundamental representation, I have determinant to the power n because I have like n component fermion. And now you see that when I exponentiate, when I write it as an exponential of something, then you have like a exponent which is proportional to n. And in addition, this term, uh, which is bilinear of rho also comes with the n. This basically says that uh, once you integrate out chi, the effective action of rho is overall proportional to this factor n which is very large in the large end limit, which basically means that you can evaluate this pass integral of rho uh, using the subtle point. And the subtle point equation takes this form. So, so from here, you get this a linear term. And from here, you get, uh, so you have like a determinant is trace log, and then you get this expression by uh, taking the variation. Okay, so this basically determines the subtle point value of rho. And, but I should also remember, remember that uh, uh, I also need to include, uh, uh, sorry. Okay, but, but let me just pause here and ask if there is any question. Any question guys, please ask. I think you proceed. Okay. All right, so, so, so my, so initially I also wanted to consider the insertion of operator O. So that's uh, something that I was not taking into account in the discussions on this slide. So let's try to do it. As I said, and in the first, in the step one and two, so if you start from this trader in step, you basically, replace this operator O with the O evaluated on the expectation value, like on the, uh, on the classical web sourced by this fermion, chi chi dagger. So here I wrote explicitly like SUN indices for later convenience. Okay, and this uh, uh, comes from two, this consists of two parts. One is this like a tau dependent part, which comes from integral and also uh, this part, which is like a bilinear fermion. So what I'm going to do now is to uh, do this replacement 
for every fields appearing inside the trace. And if I do so, then for instance, from here, I get like a Kai Kai dagger here. And from here, I get Kai Kai dagger here. From here, from this here, I get Kai Kai dagger here. And of course, because we are taking a trace, these indices are contracted, which means that I'm identified this indices and this indices and this in this, these indices. And then there is some factor which depends on uh, this parameter. And sometimes you take derivative because you want to construct a menu. So, so this part depends on like a precisely what fields you inserted. But the universal structure is this one, which is given by Kai Kai Dagger, Kai Kai Dagger, and contracted. And now uh, in the step four, I integrated, integrated out Kai's, which is basically doing the weak contraction of Kai's. And this weak, weak contraction is very simple uh, because as I said, the action is just given by this. And what's important is that this kinetic term for chi or quadratic term of, of chi uh, is color singlet. So, so if you just consider the uh, propagator, there is a factor of delta AB. Now, because of this factor delta AB, you can say that in the large n limit, the dominant weak contraction is given by the one which connects the neighboring chi's. So in principle, like because you have too many chi's, you have many chi's and you are supposed to do the weak contraction, you might worry that the combinatorics gets super complicated. But suppose for instance, you decided to uh, contract this guy and this guy. Then you have like a delta BC here. Whereas if you decide to contract this guy and this guy, you have delta BB. And delta BB immediately gives, spits you spits out a factor of n, whereas if you do a different contraction, then you just get delta BC, so you don't get a factor of n. So which basically means that in the large n limit, you just need to contract, perform these contraction. And more explicitly, I do this with, with contraction. And for each factor, I, I multiply this kinetic term. And note that the row is basically determined by the subtle point equation that I wrote earlier. Okay, so combining all these structures, uh, then uh, I can conclude that at this level, uh, I, mean I mean tree level, I can express everything in this in the following way. So I have like a multiple integral of tau's, and then I have some uh, term which depends on two positions, two tau times, and also the inser insertion of the operator. More explicitly, so this basically comes from this piece. So there is a this piece coming from just like a weak contraction, and there is also some uh, piece which depends on precise form of the operator insertion, which I wrote here. So the details of this expression is not that important, so I didn't write it explicitly, but it's important that it depends on uh, what you inserted. So pictorially, uh, what I'm doing is something like this. So you have a Wilson loop, and, and then you also have an operator, and you are contracting the operator and the Wilson loop. And then, uh, so there is some factor that depends on precisely what fields is contracted with the whistle loop, which is denoted by blue. And there is another factor which basically corresponds to propagation on this 1D system, of this 1D system, which is basically propagator of fermion. And this object, you can also write formally as a trace, operator trace of a functions of tau. That is because whenever this structure of like a tau integrals is precisely like a convolution. So you have like a, something that depends on tau zero, tau one, and tau one, tau two, and the integrate over tau one. So if these tau's are like a discrete numbers and discrete and finite numbers, this is precisely the matrix multiplication. And of course, like I also need to identify the last tau and the first tau. So that's why uh, it makes sense to write it as, as a trace. So in some sense, like what I get here is a, like a continuous version of the matrix trace. Okay. 
So now I can discuss more explicitly like the relation with the matrix product state. And so this uh, expression, you can I can also rewrite it uh, as some kind of overlap in the spin chain. And the idea is as follows. So you prepare some, so, so you are computing some uh, two point function and you want to rewrite it as some like a overlap between two states. And for the op first, you prepare some state corresponding to the single trace operator. So remember, I wanted to consider operator, which is done something like a trace of mu nu, d rho f delta nu. And I just write the same thing here and view it as some kind of like one dimensional system, like a more like a spin chain. Okay. And similarly, uh, for the for this side, what I wrote MPS, I just take this uh, expression, which uh, arose here, and then uh, and sum over all possible possibilities of like uh, adding this in, uh, of choosing this indices. It can be f mu nu or d rho f sigma delta or etc. And then I declare that I choose some orthonormal like a uh, uh, inner product between this state and this state. Then uh, basically, if I prepare this state and then contract with this state, I basically like a pick some particular value of trace of MMMM, which corresponds to this one. So in this way, I can formally express everything as a matrix product state. Uh, sorry, as, as an overlap in this one dimensional system where the one state is very simple. It depends on the operator we want. And the other state is given by this kind of a bit complicated expression, which involves like a trace of tau. And for those who know, who heard about the matrix product state, would immediately notice that this is precisely the definition of the matrix product state. And normally matrix product state is like a, a way to construct an answers for the ground state of some a gapped one plus one dimensional system. And, but here I arrived at a similar expression uh, just by rewriting the version loop. And more explicitly, uh, in order to see the more explicit relation with the matrix product state, it's kind of useful to uh, use some pictorial notation, people often using the matrix product state literature. So basically this M uh, depends on uh, three things, like a tau, tau one, two tau's, which are like a matrix indices, and then uh, extra label, which is like a flavor. So, so in, in that sense, it's a tensor. And what, what I'm doing here is basically multiplying these tensors uh, in this way, so that you contract these tau's. And then the, and the resulting objects have like a three indices, which corresponds to f mu nu's. And you contract this resulting indices with the operator that you want to compute. And that spits out uh, the two point function that you want to consider. Okay. But I should say that there is some difference from the usual matrix product state, uh, because here, uh, this uh, normally, like when you talk about a matrix product state, uh, this is really like a finite dimensional uh, matrices. But here I have like a continuous uh, object, which is tau. And by the way, like uh, the, di uh, the dimension of this uh, indices, like a number of indices is often called a bond dimension in the matrix product state of literature. And basically what I'm saying is that here I'm having like an infinite dimensional uh, matrix product state. Uh, sorry, matrix product state with infinite bond dimension. And, but I say this continuous infinity can be converted into discrete infinity uh, just because tau takes a value from zero to two pi. So I can also do the Fourier transformation and go to like mode expansion basis. And in that case, things look a little bit more normal because I have some discrete value, but still I have infinite uh, bond dimensions. And there are a couple of remarks I can make regarding, so, so far I only explained how to do it at uh, tree level Yamil theory. There are a couple of remarks I can make. 
So first remark is that this can be generalized to supersymmetric Wilson loop and all the standard Wilson loop in n equals four super mills. And what, which is coupled not only to the gauge field, but also to the scalar field. So I'm going to explain a bit more about this uh, later. And another comment I want to make is that so far uh, I was emphasizing that this approach you can generalize to loop level, but only perturbatively. But in the case of matrix model, uh, you can actually do it non-perturbatively. Well, it's not so surprising because I'm here I'm talking about the matrix model which are known to be solvable uh, by some other method. In those cases, you can actually write, uh, so this kind of uh, expectation value. So this is the analog of the Wilson loop in the case of matrix model. So here I'm really talking about like a zero dimensional matrix integral. And then you have like a, you want to compute this integral and by using our trick, you can actually rewrite some pass integral of rows at the non perturbative level in the larger limit. And that is going to give you some effective 1D description. And that's uh, currently we are kind of like a cleaning it up and there seems to be some connection to short chain. But uh, so let me just not talk about it more, talk about it more because there are some still moving parts that we are trying to fix. Okay, so now I'm going to focus more on the Suzy and case and start start making connection with integrability. But uh, is there any question before I start doing that? Any question further? Please ask. Okay. Uh, I think you proceed. <laughs> okay. Right. So, so the setup is as follows. So, okay. So, so let's consider the circular whistle. So now I'm going to uh, talk more about uh, supersymmetric Wilson loop and start making connection with integrability. And the setup is as follows. I'm going to consider circular Wilson loop but which is coupled to the gauge field as well as to the scalar field, like uh, one of the scalar field contained in n equals four super mills. And this object is often called half PPS Wilson loop because of the symmetry it preserves, but the name doesn't really matter. Uh, and, and for the operator, I'm going to consider uh, this particular combination, phi one plus i phi two, where again, phi one and phi two are like uh, real scalars. And, and take a power n. And this operator is BPS operator. It's known to be supersymmetric. And, but, and it, at finite coupling, its dimension, conformal dimension is given by this L. But again, the details don't matter, but the only thing that matters is that because thanks to the supersymmetry and thanks to the work by Peston and Giombi, we know the while the, the two point function is at finite coupling where lambda is a gm mu squared times n. So this computation was done by using localization. And, but I'm now going to show that uh, using our formalism, uh, this result arises slightly unexpected way. Okay, so let's say, let's discuss what happens if I apply MPS construction. So I'm going to skip the details, uh, but the, the resulting formula is, again, takes the same form. But, but the important point is that now I only have like a same field repeated again, again. So I have like a trace of m phi one plus i phi two to the power L. And m phi one plus i phi two is given by one times this factor, where one, uh, M, so let me just go back, uh, consisted of like a, some piece which depends on the insertion and some piece uh, which is universal and comes from this like propagate of the fermion. And for this particular choice of the operator in the circular in the Wilson loop, it turns out that I just get one here. So that's why like it's so simple. And then this is a term coming from the fermion uh, propagator. And 
And this row, as I said, is a solution to the subtle point equation. And the subtle point equation, I just wrote it again. So this is a row over G, one over this factor. And this G was actually like a fermion propagate related to some, uh, sorry, the gauge field propagator in the case of Yujo Yan Mills. Now, because the uh, Wilson loop couples also to the gauge uh, scalar field, it's basically given by some linear combination of the gauge field propagator and the scalar propagator. And what's nice about the circular Wilson loop is that this just, again, becomes constant. And in particular, it's given by lambda over four for BPS circle. And because of that, solving the subtle point equation becomes very, very trivial, in particular, if you go to momentum basis. So the idea is to take this expression, Fourier transform both sides, assuming that everything only depends on the, the difference of tau and tau prime. And after doing so, I get this expression for the, uh, for the mode rho n. So if you look at this mode expansion, you see that like I'm expanding this row in powers of like a half integers rather than integers. That's basically because rho, which is how about the stratton of each field was introduced to represent the bilinear fermion, like a chi to the chi. And because it's, it's a bilinear fermion, uh, it's actually anti-periodic. Because like a, if you, like a shift tau by two pi, then the fermion comes here. And then if you want to swap the uh, ordering of fermion, you get minus sign. And this equation is very easy to solve and it's just algebraic equation and I get this answer. And what's important is that you have some square root. And so now I just plug in this expression into the expression for m tau tau prime. So I sum over mode number. And so, so remember that this was this, and then I just like I first go to the mode basis and come back to the uh, tau basis by doing this. And, and then in, I insert this expression into here. So what's important is that uh, I have some factor which only depends on n, and then you have integral of taus. And then uh, the, the part which couples n and tau can be collected in this way. So I have two pi i n l minus n one tau one, and two pi i n one minus n two tau one tau two, and so on. And this just comes from the structure. And clearly, if I do the tau integral, I get the delta function, Kronecker deltas for uh, n i's, which basically sets all n i's to be one. So originally, I was inserting like a sum over n for each m tau tau prime, but eventually, after doing the tau integrals, I just get a single sum of n, and and the sum and is given by this object to the power l. Okay. So this is the expression I got. And let me just remind you that this row n is a solution to the subtle point equation, which contains the square root. And how do you do this sum over n? So the idea is to use what, uh, what's known as Zomapelt Watson transform. Uh, so you start from like a sum over n and rewrite it as a contour integral. So you like a, take a tangent type of tangent function, which has poles at these like uh, integer points and then rewrite this sum over n into the integral and then deform the uh, contour. And when you deform the contour, uh, it basically hits the singularity of the integral. And here, there is a singularity coming from a scale root. And so that's why after deforming the contour, you can bring this integral uh, to an integral around the square root branch cut coming from this one. And if you further change variables a little bit, then the final expression can be brought to this expression. So you have some uh, integral around x. So basically, I just re re rewrote this whole object by x and changed, rewrote the quantity. So the integral that you finally get. And now, if you want to get the result for the fundamental Wilson loop, because I was doing the computation for the generating function, I just do the Fourier transformation for this guy. And Fourier transformation of this guy is very simple because A dependence only shows up here. And as a result, I get this simple integral, which turned out to be exactly the integral expression for this special function. And then I can recover the localization result.
So this was a kind of simple demonstration of how the localization result can be recovered. But the way it gets recovered is a bit interesting because in the localization, uh, this one, this integral is basically uh, coming from the integral of the eigenvalue. So in the large end limit, like a matrix model. So if you apply the localization, everything reduces to the matrix model. And in the large end limit, the eigenvalue of the matrix is condensed and form a branch cut. And that's why you get the integral uh, along the branch cut. But here, what, what I got originally was kind of some over mode numbers, which basically correspond to the bond dimension of this matrix product state. And I did the uh, Zomafeld-Wassel transform and discovered miraculously that there is some uh, weird branch cut. And, and then uh, we wrote this sum over integer into the uh, integral over the branch cut and that precisely reproduced the integral over the eigenvalue. Okay, so this basically says that, um, yeah, sorry, okay, yeah. Let me just pause here and so this was one demonstration of how uh, this uh, uh, how this method works in an exactly solvable case. Uh, but the but so far I only discussed some uh, the result which is for the like a, which is protected or solvable thanks to the supersymmetry. And now I'm going to uh, discuss how to extend this idea when the supersymmetry is not present. Any questions so far? Okay. So, so now I'm going to discuss like uh, what happens if the, what we, sh we are gonna do uh, if the supersymmetry is not present. So in the previous example, we comp I considered uh, the correlation function between circular and half PPS operator and half PPS single trace operator. And, and I, this one was computable from localization, but I also showed that like there is a different way of arriving the same answer using the matrix product state description. But now, uh, of course, like this gives only a tiny bit of information about what, about the information distribution loop contains. And I want to extract more about this Wilson loop. And in particular, it will be nice to compute this Wilson loop, the two point function between this Wilson loop and non BPS, non supersymmetric single trace operator. And this basically tells you, like, uh, what uh, if you if I want to expand the Wilson loop in terms of local operator, what is the uh, expansion coefficient? And of course, now we don't have supersymmetry, so we cannot use localization, but instead we can use integrability and more precisely what's called integrable bootstrap. And before talking about that, uh, I need to explain a little bit more about uh, some integrability framework for the non-BPS single trace operators. And in N equals four super mills, uh, so let me just re uh, quickly tell you uh, what is N equals for super mills in terms of fields. So in N equals for super mills, in addition to the gauge field F mu nu, we also have some extra scalars. Uh, here I used a notation where phi i is the complex scalar and also some fermions. And because in Importantly, everything is in the adjoint representation, so I can construct a single trace operator by multiplying any of these objects. So for instance, I can consider this kind of object. And the second important piece of information about N equals four super mills is that for theory, and so it is a four dimensional conformal field theory. And in the conformal field theory, uh, generically, uh, a good operator basis is given by conformal set of conformal primaries. So what is conformal primaries? So conformal primaries are, first of all, the eigen uh, state of the dilatation operator. So if you 
act the dilatation operator on the operator O, then it spits out some number. So it's an eigenstate, eigenvector. And in addition, it, they are annihilated by a special conformal transformation. And so constructing such uh, conformal primaries is actually not that simple because if you just write down some naive, this like, a, let's say like a pick some any like a pr product of fields and then take a trace. And typically that's not going to give you conformal primaries. And the correct conformal primaries is often given by some complicated linear combination of various traces, single traces. And however, in the case of N equals four Pen mills, people discovered a remarkable way of like a simple and a remarkable way of constructing conformal primaries, uh, which is to relate this problem to a problem of diagonalizing Hamiltonian of some integrable spin chain, one plus one dimensional spin chain. So that's what that, that was done by uh, first by Minahan and Zarembo. For instance, uh, the simplest example is this. If you consider this uh, operator made out of just two complex scalars, phi one and phi two, then you can map this to, you can consider a formal map, which maps this operator to this spin chain state, where phi one is mapped to up spin, up spin and phi two is mapped to down spin. Now, take this expression, and then, then you ask like, uh, how does the action of the dilatation operator translate into this representation? And what Minahan and Zarembo found is that at one loop, in the gate theory, this is precisely the same as uh, the action of the Hamiltonian of what's called Heisenberg spin chain. That's the simplest, like a spin chain that you can think of. It's a, it only has a nearest neighbor interaction. And furthermore, so this was already nice because like uh, some complicated problem was mapped to some like a uh, familiar problem in spin chain or condensed matter literature. But what was nice is that uh, this, Heisenberg spin chain belong to a, a class of spin chains called integrable spin chains. So what is integrable spin chain? So the important properties of integrable spin chain is that you can construct the eigenstate by what's called beta ansatz. And uh, although they are like a non-trivial, like uh, interacting theories, uh, their eigenstates are labeled by basically momenta of individual excitation. So let me just give you a bit more information about what these two me things mean. So the idea is to take the operator O and you can map it, you can show that it can be mapped to some, uh, some spin chain state uh, with, uh, which are labeled by a set of complex numbers. And these complex numbers use uh, basically um, moment can be thought of as momenta of like a down spin in the moving in the sea of up spin. And I should say that if I translate this interpretation of momenta to the original, like a single trace description, uh, this like a one plus one, this like a spatial direction is precisely like a color direction on which we are taking a trace. So U is in some sense like a momenta moving in the color, color space. And for instance, uh, the, the simplest state is like a two particle state and it's given by this kind of expression. So it's some given by some plane wave and also like some plane wave with like a two momenta swapped and N1 and N2 are basically like position of downspin. So this is the uh, description of the state. And so what are we gonna do uh, if we have this expression? Well, uh, a nice thing about this expression is that in terms of this momentum, or sometimes people call it rapidity, you, can, you have a very simple expression for the dimension of the operator, especially one loop correction to the conformal dimension, and which is given by this expression. And here this is compressed that characterize the spin chain state, but there are some constraints and the constraints are called precisely what's called beta ansatz equation. And in the simplest case, it takes this form. So you have uh, uk plus i over two and uk minus i over two to the power l and multiply j naught equals k. And well, this 
looks like a complicated expression, but basically you have this equation for each k. So you have you have m m magnon excitation, you have m set of states, m set of equation. The physical interpretation is that it's just like a, a periodicity of the wave function. So this factor basically accounts for like uh, the phase shift when particles move around, when magnon moves around. Uh, that's why you have like L. So this is analog of E to IPL in the uh, for the uh, plane wave. And in addition, you have some uh, factor coming from the interaction between magnons, which are basically come described by S matrices. And this equation is telling us that like a, so the phase shift must becomes one if particle goes around. And What's nice is that for n equals four CPMLs, basically, the, so this was the expression for the tree level, sorry, one loop, but we know what is the finite coupling generalization of this. And using this, you can uh, write down some complete solution of what this delta is, and this was done around 2009. But the de that detail is not really necessary for my talk. Okay, so, so this was to explain that there is some mapping between the operator, single trace operator, and, and some spin chain state, in particular integrable spin chain state. But now let's go back to what we really wanted to analyze, which is the two-point function. So as I said in the beginning, the intuition from string theory tells us that uh, this uh, two-point function should be due to some kind of overlap on the string worksheet, like where one state is describing the Wilson loop and given by boundary state, and the other state is the uh, describing the operator. And, and at weak coupling in the gate theory, I just explained that this operator O is given by set of, uh, by this like a beta eigenstate, which are parameterized by set of momenta. And on the other hand, in the first part of my talk, I was kind of trying to say that the Wilson loop is given by matrix product state. So it, it has such a representation. And by comparing this expression, you, you can immediately say that basically this uh, state is the uh, like a weak coupling counterpart of this. And this, is, this was indeed true. And that's how people solved uh, this problem of spectrum by generalizing this uh, beta state to finite coupling. But on the other hand, if you look at this side, you can also say that the matrix product state we got must be the weak coupling counterpart or gauge theory counterpart of this boundary state of the string worksheet. And now the question is whether one can determine. So like a here, we know how we knew how to, we already know how to generalize the finite coupling. Now the question is how to uh, like uh, determine MPS or B at finite coupling. Okay, so this is what I'm going to do in the rest of my talk. And, and the idea is basically integrable bootstrap. Okay, but let me just pause here and ask if there is any question. Okay, so, so let me proceed. Um, so, so let's first take this picture and rotate it by 90 degrees. So you have some uh, boundary state and you have some state which are parameterized by a bunch of like momenta of excitations. And these moment, these excitations travels and then eventually got absorbed by this state. So, so this is a more like a pictorial way of exp uh, expressing what I just said. So these like uh, particles just scatter or like interact in the middle and then finally got absorbed, get, out, get absorbed by this state. And for this dynamics in the bulk, we basically know everything because we know S matrix, we know like this. And we want to ask is like, uh, what, suppose we know everything about this, can we determine uh, what is this? Like uh, what is the absorption probability? And the way to determine this is to impose the bootstrap axiom. And so here I just uh, 
I'm just using like a slice from some different talk because uh, it's, it's probably easier to read. And so, so here I wrote down three bootstrap actions. And basically that's all of them are saying that like everything happening here must be compatible with uh, what we know from the bulk. For instance, the first condition is called Watson equation. So, which is basically saying that if you change the order of the particle, then you need to multiply the S matrix. And which is very natural because that's, uh, we, that's how things, that's what S matrix is basically. Like uh, it's basically just like a swap in the order of particles. And the second condition actually assumes something a little bit more about the boundary. So, so you need to like assume that the boundary has a, some nice property, like it preserves some kind of like a infinite set of charges. But once you accept it, you can actually uh, derive or argue that uh, this kind of equation must hold. So basically you just need to uh, consider like a four particle absorption, absorption process, but in a different order. And those two different ordering must give the same answer. That's the like a bootstrap equation. In some sense, it's a bit like a crossing equation which you impose in the conformal bootstrap. So this basically gives you the relation between absorption and amplitude and the S matrix, S matrices that I denote by red dots. And finally, there is also what's called crossing equation, which is basically saying that a particle antiparticle pair does nothing. But uh, this is a little bit more elaborate, uh, but we also need to impose it. And in addition to all these axioms, we also uh, impose some symmetry property, and, uh, which is basically like what symmetry is preserved by the Wilson loop. But the details of solving uh, this, uh, these bootstrap axioms are rather technical, so I want to focus on the physical consequence of that. And to discuss the physical consequence, I just need to show some part of the solution to the axiom. So if you solve this axiom, one finds a one parameter family of solutions to the axioms. In particular, if you take two particle state and then contract it with B. And so this one parameter I denoted by A. Of course, there is a reason why I chose the parameter A, why I decided to call it A. Uh, well, sorry, yeah because it's in the end related to the uh, uh, to the parameter A, which appeared in the earlier part of my talk. But here what's important is that if you look at this amplitude, so it's given by this expression times something complicated, but what's, what's important is that it contains a pole. So, so what is the meaning of this pole? So in the case of S matrix, whenever you see a pole, it must correspond to some kind of bound state or some, uh, if it's a pole, pole is in a complex plane in the second sheet, then it, it must be the uh, resonance. And uh, something similar holds here, but now because we are not considering like S matrix process, but we are looking at some absorption process, this pole basically signals existence of excited boundary state. Uh, this is to say, this is basically saying that if you consider this process in which like a two particle gets absorbed by this state. And, and if you look closely around the pole, then there is some long lived state here, which is something like an excited version of this boundary state. And so they, this basically says that, uh, although we started from one state, B of A, but you discover a new state. And once you discover the new state, you also need to know what is the overlap between these two particle state and this new state be excited. That can be also determined by solving the bootstrap action, which is now given by this. So like uh, if you want to analyze this overlap, then this must be the same as this process in which two particles are contracted with the original uh, boundary state. And so then you actually find another pole uh, now shifted by like a pi. And then you can actually repeat this procedure and you discovered infinitely many states. 
So this poll, uh, the next poll will appear where for the excited one that you have mentioned. Right. So, so, so this poll appears in this overlap. Ah, and you, okay. you, can, you cannot see it in the original overlap. Yeah. So the idea is to like look at the poll and then determine this excited overlap by solving this new axiom. Mm -hmm. And then you find this new poll. And this process goes on. Yeah, this process goes on. Okay. So, okay, that's what it is, but this basically but, said. But, but, but what this factor, is there is any symmetry or something like that? Three by two, half, uh, something is there? Um, okay, so this, yeah, well, what's important is it's shifted by integer times i. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I is not really important. It depends on like uh, how you choose, how you define you. Yeah. And also like uh, the offset I over two is not so important either because it can be changed by like mm -hmm. absorbing, changing A. Mm -hmm. What's really important is shifted by integer. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's actually like a point of connection with my, uh, like the first part of the talk. Exactly. And because of this, like uh, this suggests that, uh, it's this overlap, uh, sorry, this two point function, like uh, the generating function of the Wilson loop and the single trace operator is not just given by a single overlap, as I was saying in the beginning, but it's given by a uh, sum of infinite overlap. Okay, so this sounds weird, but because we know everything about this by solving the bootstrap axioms, so you can just like uh, compute it and then in particular take the uh, some limit and then compare with what we can compute from the matrix product state description which is in particular powerful at weak coupling of the gate theory and the careful comparison with the mps description in perturbation theory shows that this sum over n is precisely in one to one correspondence with mode number basis for this like a matrix product trace so remember that i was saying that uh, so this matrix product state was a little bit weird because it involves like a, a integral rather than summation over indices, but I can rewrite this integral over tau into sum over uh, infinite number, infinite integer by doing the Fourier transformation. And once you do so, then you can actually see that immediately that summand actually matches. So this is a kind of funny situation. So th this is basically saying that, uh, so I start, so in the second half of my talk, I kind of basically based on the string worship picture and formulated the bootstrap action and solved, solved it and discovered infinitely many boundary states, excited boundary states. And those excited boundary states seem to be in one-to-one -one correspondence with what you are summing over when you write down the matrix product state. And I should emphasize that this was rather intriguing because normally uh, in the usual application of matrix product states, there is no guarantee that uh, the bond dimension of the matrix product state has any have any physical meanings because typically it's just like a answers that you write, uh, which is convenient to, for studying some properties of the one plus one dimensional system. But here uh, it turns out that these bond dimensions are precisely the dimension of the Hilbert space uh, or a dimension of the excitation localized at the boundary of the string worksheet. So it really is like a seeing some string worksheet degrees of freedom. So this is a bit reminiscent of what I said in the beginning that uh, the Tufuft expansion just give you a formal way of uh, classifying the Feynman diagrams into, uh, into 2D surfaces. And there is a priori no reason to believe that there is something physical for the 2D surfaces, but ADS CFT tells you that there should be something physical, which is basically string versus theory. And similarly, here, uh, matrix product state, the bond dimension of the matrix product state is not something very, very physical, but uh, you can see that it's actually physical by comparison with the exact ability uh, of and so now the question is, okay, so now we could actually see something about like excitation localized at the boundary of string worksheet. Can we see more 
is in particular some excitation on the uh, bulk of the string. And that'll be great, but of course, like MPS is probably not enough because MPS is always just like a uh, summation of a single, like a circle. So it always looks like a boundary. So maybe if there is a, some natural way of replacing this matrix product state to tensor network, which have like a yet another dimension, there might be some uh, way to see the string war sheet. But this is just a speculative comment. Okay, so actually, like, uh, I was much faster than I was planning. Uh, but let me just summarize. And if you have any further question about any points, I can maybe expand a little bit. Uh, but let me first summarize. So I presented a reformulation with a Wilson loop in large and gay series as a matrix product state. And as I was emphasizing, uh, so far the construction is perturbative, uh, except in n equals four super mills where we can use integrability. Well, by the way, another exception is a large and matrix model in which you can actually uh, rewrite the expression uh, at the non perturbative level. And so, so, so at this point, for a general, like a pure M mills, uh, it's just a different way of rewriting. Uh, and, and it's not that efficient. It's not like uh, any more efficient than doing the usual perturbation theory in terms of computing expectation value of Wilson loop. The reason why I feel it's promising is that in the case of n equals four super mills, it, it does have a direct relation with the excitation on the boundary of the string worship. So it must seem, it seems like it's a right, right way of capturing uh, the dual string war sheet. And if you want to convert, if you want to turn this method or turn this idea to something more uh, effective, then you could ask like, uh, can we directly constrain or bootstrap MPS corresponding to the Wilson loop without computing it perturbatively. For instance, like uh, can we just, for instance, rewrite the loop equation, which we know to be non-perturbative in terms of MPS and try to make an answer for what MPS is for pure young mu theory in the large and limit, for instance. So those are questions that might be interesting to uh, pursue, but at the same time, it might be difficult. But uh, anyway, I feel like a, there might, it might be interesting question to think about. Okay, so with that, let me just, uh, let me finish this talk. So thank you, Shota, for giving such an elaborative and nice talk. And I, I don't know why people suddenly disappear. <laughs> uh, like those who have already here, uh, do you have any question? If you have any question, please ask him. And uh, if not, you can write to him. Once I will put, post it YouTube, you can, if you have any particular question, you can write to him as well. Um, uh, yeah, so any question? Any particular question? I don't know. Okay. So, yeah, like, uh, so this talk will be uh, posted in YouTube. Uh, okay. I will share the link and uh, uh, yeah, like uh, uh, in, in future, maybe I will uh, ask you uh, again after some time, once you have some new ideas to share with us and uh, give a talk. Uh, I don't know, like today I, didn't find a lot of people, but usually a lot of people come. Uh, I, okay, okay. This, this is my experience. Okay, uh, but the talk was nice, and I'm uh, hopeful that once it, it will be posted, uh, people will be benefited out of that. Okay. Yeah, well, yeah, maybe one reason is I actually gave the same talk last week, so maybe, maybe. some people already heard. But. Maybe, 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 but anyways, uh, this talk was good and uh, it, it is okay. No problem. Thanks. So.